Okay, uh, very good. So um, uh, uh, Dan and I were starting to talk about the um, uh, whole remote uh, computing framework uh, given by, um, uh, uh, well, I suppose the success of layers going up is um, uh, eventual send, uh, the EAPI and the tilde.syntax, syntax, uh, the uh, Marshall layer and the CAPTP layer, which uh, uh, together that, that stack turns JavaScript into a distributed programming language um, where you can use uh, tilde.dot to uh, invoke remote objects and access, access fields of remote objects um, in a way that, that uh, provides promise pipelining. Uh, and we were just uh, discussing the recent observation that uh, the EAPI, but not the tilde syntax, uh, supports um, uh, uh, destructuring uh, in a way that one could imagine would eventually let us avoid the copying, uh, but currently, I mean, avoid retrieving the entire object rather than just the parts you're interested in. Uh, but currently, um, uh, it does not enable us to avoid the copy. Um, so let me, let me actually find the relevant place where the destructuring is written up, and then I will uh, project my screen. Uh, what's the name of the wavy dot uh, transform or the tilde dot? Um. Uh, so um, let me find it. Hold on. Oh, sorry, you're, you're already looking for something. I was hoping somebody yeah. else could. Oh, okay. Yeah, like, um, uh, are you talking about um, the package to make the transform? Like the, um, I think there was um, a, like a, like a, you know, um, Acorn plugins and, and yeah. plugins. Um, yeah, I found, okay, cool. Yeah, I found the Acorn one. I was just I was also checking for about one, but yeah, thanks. I, I think I've got a good lead now. It's in the Gork uh, word. So for the um, uh, the tell dot or wavy dot uh, syntax is the um, the repository that you found uh, agoric slash transform eventual send. Yeah, yeah, that's the one I, I found and looks like the one I was looking for. Okay, so I'll go ahead and paste that into our chat. Yeah. Cool. Oh, it's already there. Yep. So there you go. Okay. Um, oh, and there's also Acorn eventual send. Um, yeah. So, so um, is it clear which one we're using, or? Um, yeah, or, they're they're both fairly recent. Um, so I think okay. I think Michael's maintaining both. Okay. Okay. Probably because of uh, the different tools, trying to get all these different tools to to recognize wavy dot syntax. Different tools are based on different parsers. Yeah. 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 Sounds like. Yeah, we were just talking about that this morning. Um, uh, yeah, uh, Michael's yeah, Michael's getting the um, uh, our prettier. Oh, there's Michael. Um, uh, so Michael, I was just explaining about how you're getting the uh, uh, tilde dot support uh, into our use of various tools, um, and we were uh, is so we were wondering first of all which repositories. Uh, we found both transform eventual send and acorn eventual send. Are those the right two repositories? 
Uh, you want to be looking at Agoric Labs. That's oh. where I have all the forks for these different things. Okay. And, oh, cool. and where did the discussion of destructuring and promise pipelining end up? I've been, I tried to look for that and I was, have not found it yet. Uh, like in terms of the all comparable? Or, oh, no, no. you mean with the, oh, yeah, okay. Just, just so, the synta syntactic destructuring. Yeah, so the destructuring using um, e.g, for example. Yes, yes, that's yeah. exactly the one I'm, I'm thinking of. I haven't actually tested it, but it, it seems to work. <laughs> yeah, just, I'm just one, oh, I'm just wondering where where is, I was thinking of, of finding it and projecting it, but I can't find it. Oh, okay, uh, yeah, I'll look. Um, just give me a second here. Okay. Oh, is this in that uh, issue I opened on eventual send? I think that may have been it and I haven't caught up yet. Yeah, we... Uh, it very well might be. Okay, here I, here's a link to that. It, it does mention e.g. Um, oh, I don't I'm think this... Yeah, the structuring doesn't come up there. Right, so it's not this one. But e.g is the thing that you would use to, the, thi the thing that I, um, uh, yeah, that you would use to do the kind of destructuring I was talking about. Um, uh, uh, in any case, um, uh, Dan or um, uh, Michael, uh, I know you're in the middle of looking, but uh, Dan also had another question for which uh, you're the right person to ask, uh, which is, uh, when just using Node right now, is there some way to set things up so that you can use the tilde syntax while using Node? Hmm. Um, I think the only way when you're just using Node is to do some kind of rewrite. Uh, and there are, there are ways of doing a Babel rewrite, for example. Um, I'm just not, I, I haven't done this for a while though. Okay. Yeah, no problem. So uh, the, um, so the, the, the topic we started with is uh, Dan has been looking at uh, our CAPTP um, and uh, comparing what the functionality we provide with uh, what he's currently doing now um, uh, and thinking about uh, switching over from what he's doing now to CAPTP uh, and um, uh, what are some of the enhancements to CAPTP that would be good for CAPTP that would also uh, uh, help Dan switch. Is that a fair, fair summary? Um, yeah, yeah. I think, I think that basically I found out that CAPTP was doing it had basically the exact same layer of the stack goals that this module I was working on had. Um, and I think the only, the only advantage that I have left for mine is, uh, is just ergonomics of not needing the, uh, the E, but, but with the transform, I guess you don't need the E, you get the eventual send and with pipelining, there's some very, very big benefits to doing that. Um, yeah. 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 The so reason think, we, yeah. yeah, the reason we did not just use dot, uh, you know, we, you know, we realized we, we, you know, that that perhaps we could do something or other with proxies, uh, like the the capital e is doing, but somehow be able to just use the dot directly. And the reason we didn't is um, uh, uh, a principle that we introduced uh, in the e language, a notational principle uh, that I've come very strongly to believe in, uh, is that you should be able to tell at the call site without having to look things up elsewhere, whether mm -hmm. you're looking at an immediate call or an eventual send. Uh, mm -hmm. And the reason is that um, uh, in their typical cases, they have very, very different side effect contracts. Uh, and uh, also the eventual send provides you a strong guarantee against interleaving. Um, uh, so uh, either the capital E syntax or the tilde syntax 
uh, in both cases, uh, you can just tell looking at the call site that what you're seeing is something eventual. If you just had a bare dot, it would look like an immediate call, but the scheduling uh, and location could, could be very different than you expect. Right. Um, is, is there a reason that you would want to distinguish between an uh, eventual send and just another promise returning method that's maybe local? Yes. Um, uh, if you're, if, so you can certainly um, uh, invoke a, a, a local method with dot that returns a promise, but the method itself executes now. Uh, it executes mm -hmm. during your turn um, uh, and it runs to the, the synchronous part of it runs to completion before it returns. Mm -hmm. uh, so you've got a potential reentrancy there. Uh, and uh, sometimes that sometimes that's what you want, uh, but uh, uh, if you see an eventual send, then you know that no matter what it is you're invoking, it can't disrupt what you're doing during this turn. Uh, I okay, just yeah, posted the uh, I, I posted the destructuring comment in the chat. Okay, good. Well, thank you. Yeah. So um, uh, a question that Dan asked uh, about uh, the destructuring is, is it conceivable that by changing something about CAPTP and Marshall, uh, we could successfully turn a destructuring get like this into something that only fetches the, uh, the things named and doesn't cause the overhead of fetching the additional parts of the object that in the destructuring pattern are clearly uh, not retained. Well, the, uh, the e.g doesn't actually do a fetch, right? right? So it's only triggered by the actual dereference or the index made on it. This sounds very much like the the issue of, of um, doing a method call where you wanted to know that you're going to be calling so that you didn't have an extra round trip for, um, you know, first fetching a reference to the method and then invoking the method. Um, this feels like a very similar kind of question, but with a, a wider variety of different ways it can manifest itself. Right, so the so so the so that's a good point, which is with our pipelined uh, uh, message sends, uh, it is the case that uh, a uh, structure of objects that are connected to each other only by uh, method behavior, uh, you by sending a a uh, by sending a expression tree of those method calls, uh, promise pipelining turns, to, turns it into one round trip, but it's a round trip that only fetches what you asked for. Uh, with the eventual get, uh, as far as the low level semantics of what we proposed to the committee, uh, it could do that as well. With regard to the actual behavior of CAPTP and Marshall, uh, the, we divide objects into pass by copy and pass by presence. Pass by presence meaning, uh, you know, send right now meaning set, always send remote messages to the actual object. Um, uh, and uh, this would still, the, the invocation of Bob P till dot foo if that evaluates to a promise for a pass by copy struct or record, whatever we're calling it, record, um, then the record would still be copied, even though we're also immediately sending uh, pipeline gets right behind it. So Given the pipeline gets, is there some, would, would there be some way for CAPTP and Marshall to tell that, that the pipeline gets are the only accesses and it should not bother sending back a copy of the object? Uh, 
right? I mean, it feels like you want to be able to annotate your, you know, you, what, what you send to describe what it is you're going to do with it so that it can provide the appropriate parts and, and not the others. And, yeah. and, 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 and in the general case, that seems weird. Yeah, we do have one special case that we already support uh, that uh, is kind of similar to the special case in some ways, which is uh, uh, send versus send only, and likewise for all the other yes. operations. Yes. If the operation yeah. appears in a, in a, if the expression appears in a context where syntactically uh, it's locally clear that there's no use made of the value of the expression, uh, then it takes a different uh, path through the, uh, through the system by, by the only variants that know that there's no need to do the bookkeeping to send back a result because nobody pay, will pay attention to the it, result anyway. Th this was actually uh, something similar to a, a distributed file sy system uh, API in uh, the late 90s. It's called Luster and basically they had something called intents. So when you open something, you told it, do I intend to read it? Do I intend to write it? Do I intend to do whatever mm -hmm. else? And it was, a, it was essentially a way of avoiding those round trips to say, yes, that's what I'm going to do with it. So only don't bother contacting the metadata server. I don't want to know the size of it. I just want to know the object directly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But uh, it's, it's messy, like uh, as, as Chip said. <laughs> yeah. It's, yeah. It, it really it's kind of an intermediate level API. Like you wouldn't ever want to use that to actually program stuff. But uh, if, if you could tell syntactically what the intents were, then you could give hints to the, the underlying rewrite as to what okay. was going on. So since our tilde rewrite already looks at that tiny bit of context, uh, you could imagine that I mean, for the, the, the piece of code that you're showing on the screen right now, um, we could imagine that something like that could be recognized where instead of the return result either being ignored or reified, that it's only destructured and, and um, because destructuring is syntactic, uh, in which case we know that it's be that everything else is partially ignored. I mean, that, they, that, that everything else is ignored, so altogether the return result is partially ignored in a, in a way that's uh, syntactically stated. It seems pretty messy and complicated, but it is interesting that it is sort of undeniably implied by the syntax, assuming you know what the meaning of e.g dot is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That that's a good summary. I, I think there's clearly good alternatives for for practice, but yeah, maybe an opportunity for a future optimization. Okay. This was the other example with doing object destructuring in a similar way. So that would just call the dot A and dot B of the E dot G. Right. Yeah, and, those and, Go ahead. Yeah, sorry, I just wanted to basically ask how that's even possible. Is, is it because it's returning a proxy and so these keys are uh, triggering lookups that are returning? Yes, right. oh, okay. Yeah, that's exactly ah, very right. Cool. E dot G returns the getter proxy uh, and the getter proxy turns immediate gets into eventual gets. And then That's the pattern match, the pattern match causes uh, immediate gets on the value, the right hand side value. Right, right. Yeah. Does the array form also do an immediate get on the length property? Oh. Um, I would be somewhat surprised if it did that, but 
it could because mm -hmm. an, an array with just an invalid index just gives undefined, which is what the behavior of the matching is. Okay, but so, so likewise, if you just did an immediate get of an out of bound, out out of bounds array index, mm -hmm. uh, a JavaScript array would also give undefined. Uh, yeah. Okay, so here here's a untested speculation, which is uh, as long as it's an array like like you're showing, it would just fetch the indices. But if the array pattern contains a triple dot, then it would ask for that. Mm, yeah, probably. Or we do something like slice. Uh, <laughs> depends. Hmm. So, um, sorry, it seems like I was distracted and I honestly were. Uh, but um, I just noticed one thing about the example. Um, and I think, Michael, we've already talked about this uh, once before, about whether or not it's um, assumed asynchronous or, or um, explicitly uh, awaited. Um, so an eventual send at this point, um, there is no await uh, on, on the example on the screen. Mm -hmm. um, so would await fit somewhere here, or is there something I missed? So await, so, I'm sorry, go ahead, Michael. Yeah, so the XP and YP uh, explicitly say that you get back promises in those slots. So there is no await that's going on yet. OK. Yeah, if you, yeah, if you did, if you, if you did uh, the, what you expect to do with the await, where you say const open square bracket x comma y equals um, await of Bob P till dot foo, the pop, Bob P till dot foo is still doing an eventual send to Bob P, which is remote, uh, but the await forces a round trip. So you lose, you lose promise pipelining doing the await. Uh, yeah. uh, um, also something that I'm increasingly suspicious of uh, as I encounter awaits in the code that Agoric has written, and as I encounter external explanations about Use, uses of await uh, out on the web uh, is I'm starting to believe that uh, that await is an attractive nuisance. Await seems more usable to people because it leads them into ignoring issues that are not ignorable uh, into um, uh, uh, and therefore will will write code that is not concurrency safe that they might not have been led into writing if they were using promises explicitly. Uh, so, so um, yeah. I'm, I'm a little surprised that you phrased that as you're beginning to become suspicious. I yeah. was initially very suspicious of it. I was initially kind of uh, really resistant to await. And then I went into a pre period of much less skepticism. Uh, and now I'm going back to uh, more intense skepticism and fear. So um, could I, could I um, uh, give like a, a different spin or a different take on this? Um, granted, when you use promises, you actually use the power of promises. And when you use await, you actually um, use some of the power of promises. Um, but you also design for a weight. Um, and so whenever you want to have that little extra degree of freedom um, and you want your code to, uh, to be useful for people who use a weight, um, then you try to consider something like uh, async generators um, uh, or async iterators. It could be generator or not, it doesn't matter. Um, so, so I think I think await kind of like restricts what you can do with promises. But if you don't design, uh, you know, to utilize what you cannot await from promises, then uh, you can, you know, live all your life as a happy developer and never even see what you miss. Um, so, so I think there, it's just it's just whether or not people are using the features um, as sugar or as features. So, so here's the, the 
thing that is uppermost to my mind with a weight that I'm finding explanations on the web not drawing attention to. A weight marks an interleaving point that the state, uh, this, the state of objects on the heap before the await um, uh, uh, are then modified by arbitrary other interleavings, other turns be, uh, uh, in the interval from before the await till after the await. And uh, if people don't know that, then they'll write code where they're doing something with state before the await and then make um, uh, uh, uns incorrect assumptions about what state has, sta has, has remained stable on the other side of the await. Yeah, I mean, I think my experience watching what people do is it's not that they aren't aware that there's an interleave point there. It's that that's, you know, one of the first things they're taught as part of becoming familiar with this weight feature. And it's kind of like, yeah, yeah. And then they, per, they and then, and then they forget it again as you, you know, most of the time can get away with treating it as if it was um, a synchronous blocking operation. And because you can get away with that a large fraction of the time, they just fall into the habit and they completely forget um, that, yeah. that, that there's this, this, this interleave going on until of course it comes around to bite them in the ass, but then that's, that's much later. I think yeah. that's the important point though. Um, it doesn't bite them enough to become memorable. And, that, that, and that's, that's what has me specific, particularly scared of it, which is a bug that, uh, that, um, that, is, that, that is easy not to notice and that when you don't notice it, it usually works correct anyway, uh, is a particularly hazardous thing to have in a set of programming practices. Yeah, th I think your, your term attractive nuisance is particularly apt in this regard. And one of the things that, that scares me most is code that is coincidentally correct. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so it's, one of the... It's it's saying okay we have this wonderful uh, event loop concurrency we have no we have no interleaving problems, and then poof we're back into the the patterns that threads have let us into. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The the uh, code with lots of awaits is basically uh, shared memory multi-threading code. Well, it's it and it's it's particularly bad because um, because of await contagion. <laughs> yeah, which makes it really fun to try to solve one of those problems in an await based code base. You have to design all kinds of data structures just to do synchronization again. <laughs> oh, <laughs> it's really, uh, okay. I, I've, I was in the middle of that in the, my, my previous job because we were using await all over the place. So oh, wasn't it working great? Oh, but we have this server that sometimes gets the order wrong. Right. Well, the thing is, <laughs> once you put in one await, it tends to trigger the addition of lots more awaits that aren't actually by any means strictly necessary except to satisfy the fact that 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 things get turned into into async functions which didn't need to be um, but they need to be async functions because you can only use a wait inside an async function but now their return is now a promise so they have to be um, uh, called with promise handling semantics and so their callers get wrapped in async functions and it just like i say it's contagious it floats up up the up the call graph um, until you know every function is you know, sort of gratuitously asynchronous even though there's really no no fundamental uh call for that to be, be the case yeah in the agoric code base right now i would say we are guilty of this uh, a, a significant amount of our code was um, uh, 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 shaped by uh, uh, trying to have a tremendous amount of functionality ready and working in time for uh, 
uh, the hackathon at SF Blockchain Week, uh, and we did, and that went tremendously well, and and uh, various projects um, making use of our infrastructure, including Dan's, uh, got a word. Uh, Dan's, by the way, I love the t the title of it: uh, Agoric on MetaMask on Agoric, because he was running our smart contracting framework. Um, user interface inside the MetaMask framework as a plugin. And then the MetaMask framework, of course, of course is built on CES. Um, uh, so in any case, we got, we got the, the higher levels all working in time to do that kind of distributed smart contracting, uh, but we did it without trying to avoid async await. And we ended up with some race conditions exactly where you would expect from this ignore, ignoring uh, of a weight being a uh, interleaving point and having atomicity expectations that are um, uh, invalidated by, by an await. Um, uh, at this point, uh, what I've you know, suggested is that we should do a rather uh, pervasive effort to rewrite async functions into explicit use of promises. And I'm expecting that in that effort, we will encounter some cases which are significant pain points. Um, and um, uh, uh, and that those pain points might teach us that there are actually some uses of async await that are actually good uses. Uh, because the, the reason why I, I, you know, my paranoia about async await went down for a long time is because a lot of complex promise code actually does read more simply. And there's an aspect of logic that's clearer when reading async functions with awaits, um, uh, especially when there's sort of complex control that you have to encode by other means. Um, uh, so, so even though there's, in one way, using explicit promises reduces the likelihood of certain kinds of bugs, because the code is harder to follow, uh, it increases the likelihood of other bugs. Um, and I think the only way we're going to figure this out is by trying to do this conversion and seeing where it hurts. Yeah. One of the things we had at uh, Ampersand was a library of, of, of stuff for translating back and forth between the worlds of promises and, and not, and um, uh, that, that, that made it much easier to, um, you, you know, if you want to, if you want to invoke an async function and rather than doing an await on it, but just explicitly handle the promise immediately yourself and, and treat it sort of the way you would back before async and await were available in the language where you have to, to, to just basically do all the, the, the uh, you know, the, the re resolution plumbing yourself, um, mm -hmm. having, a, 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 a library which made that much less painful, made it less likely that you just put in an await because that was just sort of the lazy, easy way to deal with the fact that you had a thing that was returning a promise. So what are some of the abstractions? I don't, that... I frankly, I don't remember because I haven't used any of that stuff in, in, in a year and a half. I'll interject something that, uh, that JF pointed out, which was the QT library, C-U-T-I-E. And uh, it has something called the async tree pattern. And it's basically you write functions that can take as arguments asynchronous or synchronous other functions uh, all the way down to their arguments. And it does the, the mechanics of resolving the promises and there's other async patterns that it can handle too, like callbacks and stuff like that. And you basically create different classes for every kind of uh, combination of promises that you have. Uh, and it doesn't use then at all, and it doesn't use await.
could you repeat that maybe with some informative text on the screen or, or sure or, yeah or, okay i see where this was Mm -hmm. Yeah, because that because in general, that's, you know, the other <coughs> approach to, you know, the, the first line of defense against identifying the painful cases is what are the missing abstractions? Mm -hmm. And right. to the degree to which we can provide the missing the missing abstractions in libraries, rather than having people uh, go back to async await, uh, I think that would be good. Yeah, okay. I'm just gonna paste this. Chat, chat, chat. I will I will also go I will go back and, 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 and see if I can dig out the uh, um, the, the, the the libraries we, we did at Ampersand because I think um, I think uh, Connor has open sourced this. I'm not sure, but I, I think those might be available. Yeah, so um, the reason uh, sorry, the reason why I, I pointed the await uh, part was um, uh, I know there's uh, one syntax uh, for um, uh, assignment, like remote assignment. Um, and obviously, when you're making this, uh, you're getting back a promise. Uh, but it's an assignment expression if you're using the till dot. Um, so, so my question, I, I guess, to Michael at this point was, um, like, how do you know um, that the assignment took place? Um, and then you would just wrap this assignment in parentheses, and it's basically an expression that returns promises. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, so, um, so is that still how it's going to be? Or is that like the permanent uh, state? Uh, so, uh, uh, yes, it's the, uh, I mean, that's the logic of what we're proposing. So assuming that our proposal goes forward, uh, the, uh, I, so I take it your, your, the syntax you're referring to is like um, uh, base object uh, till dot property name equals value. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, so that returns a promise and uh, it immediately returns, of course, a uh, unresolved promise and then uh, if the um, promise, when the promise fulfills, that's the acknowledgement that the assignment has happened. Uh, and if you're in a messaging system that preserves uh, at least point-to-point -point FIFO message order, then uh, even if you don't wait for um, the acknowledgement, uh, if you subsequently send messages to the same object, uh, those messages should arrive after the assignment has happened, simply because of FIFO message delivery. Uh, sure. Eventual send and till dot, those proposals don't guarantee FIFO message delivery. Um, so, so, sorry, sorry to, uh, so, so I just wanted to take that example one step further. Uh, sometimes you do an assignment and you chain your assignments. Uh, like you want to assign on three or four different objects. Uh, or on the same object with different keys, um, one value. Um, and obviously, um, till dot having an assignment component to it, um, some people will want to try to chain assign or you know, at least would want to know how, how to um, imagine the flow there. So is it something that we want to discourage? Or is it something that is stable? But I, I believe what you were just saying that it might not be as stable if you chain um, uh, till dot assignments. Um, and so, so yeah, so maybe maybe you guys thought of that landscape a little bit more. In, so in general, when you're dealing with promises, I find that it's best to have intermediate values actually assigned to variables if you want to reuse them for stuff. Uh, and just because you can only set then on a promise once, because once you've done it, you can't do it again unless you have a reference to that original value again. Yeah, that's a normal promise, right? Not a promise with the semantic, um, 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 you know, um, like with the apparent semantics of it being that the assignment occurred, but rather you're writing an expression that looks like an assignment. So, so in your mind, um, you're working, you know, 
based on the on, on what on how the syntax looks it looks like an assignment you know it's a little bit different um, but your mind will be attracted to thing there so so is there maybe room to explore whether or not something can be made to at least consider chaining or at least make it very very clear you shouldn't So one thought might be to have a different kind of operator instead of assignment, but I, I don't know because in, in the things that I've actually worked on, I haven't had to use the, the uh, assignment yet. And I'm not sure of all the interactions between what you do and where, where it all goes. Yeah, uh, I've, um, the issue about what to recommend is a good question because I have never wanted to use remote property assignment uh, and I've never wanted to use remote property deletion. The only things that I ever actually do eventually are, uh, are invocations um, uh, and property gets. Uh, and uh, the event, the, and uh, in fact, our higher levels, uh, CAPTP and Marshall, um, uh, last I knew only supported invocations and gets. Uh, the reason why the others are in the TC39 proposal is largely uh, in order to have the proposal as a whole fit into the language in a more natural way uh, so that there is, uh, so that what you would expect to be there by symmetry with the rest of the language is there if it doesn't conflict with any principle. And the uh, eventual assignment and eventual delete doesn't conflict with any principle. Um, uh, uh, I want to, uh, Saul, I want to direct your attention to the line I just typed into chat, which is the, when X is local, uh, the X tilde dot foo equals V, uh, is essentially equivalent to x dot then, um, you know, t arrow t dot foo equals v. Uh, so uh, include, I mean, it's and it's and uh, it's like that, including with regard to what the returned value is. I believe, Michael, is that correct? The value that the left-hand side returns when x is local will be the same as the as the value that the right-hand side returns. Uh, I, I think this is basically how we how we uh, you know portrayed portrayed the whole assign. Um, being, if you wrap it in parentheses as an expression and you, you put that on the right hand side, it sets the, the promise. Um, but, okay, so, so I'm, I'm just wondering, T here is the uh, remote, right? So, no, the, the example that I, that I put, that I wrote down here was when X is local, uh, and what, what, just to, to be completely explicit, when X is a local promise for, for a local object, so T would be the local fulfillment of the local X promise. Yeah. Well, could we, could we say uh, um, the semantics of assignment, um, until today, they all happened on, on, on the same paradigm. You're assigning from the right-hand side to the left-hand side. Um, but when you chain assign from the right-hand side to the left-hand side, everything on the left-hand side is assigned the, uh, you know, the most right-hand side value, irrespective of whether or not these properties um, you know, have getters that change that value or not along the way. It's not like you assign it to the first and then you get it back uh, and, and that get could actually be different than what was assigned. So you don't chain compute if any computation happens. You just carry the right most value and you pass it along as assignments to every step. 
So what I'm trying to say is if you change till dot assignments, not, not normal assignments, um, you would have a, uh, an internal field on the promise that says the right-hand side value that you know, triggered this was this. And so and, uh, you know, the next till dot assignment outwards would actually, regardless of the promise, um, because there were no awaits, there was nothing to indicate that you wanted to actually um, do anything other than assign, um, then you would actually take that internal uh, field, uh, which is the most right-hand side value. Um, if you hit a normal assignment, then you, you, you know, take that promise and you put it in the normal assignment. Um, this way, you're saying that those are two paradigms. Um, an assignment in one is always um, a promise in the other, um, yeah. but but it, you know it, assigning in the till dot domain is all, or paradigm is always um, doing the normal way of assigning the right the you know, rightmost hand side value. Mm. Is that, um, I don't know if I, you know, made a big mess of things, but yeah. No, no, the, the, you're, making, you're making a valid point. Uh, let, me, uh, let me restate it to make sure I'm understanding the point you're making. Uh, yeah. If you have uh, X, let, let, let me actually just write down an example. I, I think I might phrase it differently. I think you are making a big mess of things and that's kind of the point, which is, Oh my gosh, there's a big mess lurking in here. <laughs> so okay. is that a, a good mess or a bad mess? Well, like, it's, okay. it's an illuminating mess. Okay, so in the, um, the expression I just wrote down, uh, x till dot foo equals y till dot bar equals v. Um, the, uh, with the expansion that we currently have, um, uh, the y till dot v, uh, as, and also again, just for clarity, assume everything's local. Let's not worry about rem the remote case. Uh, if everything's local, then the y till dot equal v uh, has the expansion into then uh, that I showed earlier. And therefore the value of that expression is itself a promise for what the, the assignment will return. Uh, what the assignment will return will be the value of v, um, uh, but uh, therefore the right-hand side of the outer equals, the value of that right-hand side is not v, it's a promise for v. And what that means is that uh, the outer assignment will do a dot then on x to eventually assign to x's fulfillment dot foo, but the thing that it's going to eventually assign to foo is not v, it's going to eventually assign to foo a promise for v, which is different from the thing it eventually assigned to bar. Uh, and that's surprising and not what people would expect simply taking their intuitions about dots and trying to carry them forward into the world of till dot. Um, Is that, Solemn, I getting it? Well, yeah, I, I count as people, but I, I don't speak for people, so yeah. Uh, like for me, I know, I know like this feels like, um, like, you know, if I'm doing um, V as, as the right um, most, um, whatever, and there are equal signs that I would not have expected that um, one of the assignments, x uh, till dot foo, is all of a sudden a um, rejected promise um, as opposed to being v, because that, that allowed the intermediate assignment to influence okay. uh, what is passed to x till dot. Okay, so for, so for that one, I'm going to defend the rejection semantics because in the synchronous realm, when it's just dots rather than till dots, 
if the y dot bar assignment throws, then the x dot foo assignment never happens. Think as if y is undefined, for example. Yes. Or if bar is a read-only property. Or bar is a setter which has a failure. Then await here is actually a good language feature. Well, I mean, no, you're, you're the, I'm saying that the, that the existing semantics of tilde dot will, will also assign to foo a rejected promise, which is the, which I think is the correct extension into the asynchronous realm of the rejection of the synchronous rejection behavior the dot has. I think to make this a bit better, we could introduce the idea of anti-resolve. And to say that when, because, because what's happening is that V is being passed as an argument to these assignments, right? Uh -huh. And when V is local, we want actually the local thing. We don't want the promise for the local thing. Okay. Um, so, so then the, oh, sorry. No, go, go ahead, go ahead. So then the semantics might be that uh, it's not really x dot, it's more like x dot then t arrow uh, const b equals No, Zoom is correcting my typing. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry for joining late, but uh, what I see right now is a static screen. Is that intended? Uh, you should be looking at the chat. Oh, thank you. Okay. Uh, Constant equals. Oh. Do people newly joining see the old chat? Yes. Yes, they do. Uh, okay. I, don't, I don't think they actually do in Zoom. I think um, uh, unless they're uh, promoted maybe, but uh, let's see. So I'm gonna- No, it, it works no, fine. The, the chat history is, is not available. It's only things for me that I see after I joined. Oh, okay. But that's, that's all right, I can, I'll catch up. So even even if I promoted you, it's still uh, it's still missing. It doesn't keep a history of its chat. Correct. Uh, no, I'm not sure where I'm going with this. Um, I, I I guess what I was wondering is, can we recapture some of the local semantics by? Uh, as Sala was describing, he was saying, putting a slot on the promise for the right-hand side. But the way you've described that before, Mark, is that's essentially what anti-resolve does, is it takes a promise and gives you back what it was resolved with. Yes. Uh, uh, it doesn't do it, obviously, by putting a slot on it. Uh, I mean, mm -hmm. not a visible property on it, uh, but it does it by the, but, but yes, it does do it by the equivalent of sort of putting an internal slot on it, but but using a weak map instead. Um, the boy, do I not want to introduce anti-resolve into the into the semantics <laughs> at this low level? Yeah. Um, I'm wondering whether. We should withdraw from. Okay, uh, I well, let me just raise this possibility and get reactions because I don't know how I feel about it. Um, uh, I only find useful and would only practically recommend for people using our uh, distributed promise system uh, using uh, eventual invocation, both method and function, and eventual get. I would recommend against actually using eventual assignment or eventual delete. Therefore, the question that I want to get reactions to is, 
should we actually withdraw from both the eventual send proposal and the TILDOT proposal support for eventual assignment and eventual delete? I'll add to this one eventual has, which came up. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes, and eventual has. Is eventual has. Um, uh, I don't know how you'd invoke it from the language, but. Yeah, uh, meaningfully different from get? Uh, yes, uh, get cannot, will give you an undefined for a missing property. Uh, has will tell you that the, which, which you can't distinguish from a property that, that exists, but whose value is undefined. I, 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 yes, that is true. That is not actually, that is a valid answer to the question I asked, but it's not the answer to the question that I was actually asking. <laughs> um, is, is, which is to say, is the, is the, uh, the, the sort of downstream behavioral consequences um, of, you know, sort of, uh, of, of an eventual has different from an eventual get in the, in the sense that does it introduce the same kind of weird, oh my God, uh, what is going on here? Um, issues that, uh, that we just encountered with set. Well, it gives you back a promise for a Boolean whose fulfillment will be either true or false. Uh, and, and in, in the presence of, uh, well, I, I think it would be more relevant to uh, do that with optional chaining rather than uh, an explicit has call. Right, does op optional chaining doesn't have, a, have a, an, uh, an analog to has. That's correct. Right. That's correct. Optional case, chaining is checking the left-hand side, not right. the right-hand side. And so, the, so the the my sense of the reason for having all of these operations here is for for orthogonality um, and and sort of being parallel with the 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 semantics of the existing operators. And um, uh, but uh, again. Uh, like the problem with the eventual set is that it doesn't return you the, the right hand side. No, 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 no. And the problem with eventual delete, delete is it returns your promise. Oh no. Yeah, yeah, you jumped in the middle on me there. Um, <laughs> okay. the, 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 the argument for having them is orthogonality, which is very appealing at a kind of a, a surface level. Yeah. Um, the argument for taking them out is actually it's a semantic swamp. Um, and I think the semantic swamp argument is stronger in terms of the, 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 the deep rationale for this language feature, but poses you uh, a challenge of how do you respond to people who aren't evaluating the proposal in a deep way and are therefore saying, well, you've got this, these things, why don't you have set in there? And, um, and so it makes the, I think it, it might make the proposal harder to sell. Although mm -hmm. I suspect if you succeed in selling it, it would be better to have sold uh, something that doesn't have these time bombs in it. Yeah, yeah. I think, I think that this discussion we just had on the semantics of chained eventual set is actually enough ammunition to explain why we're withdrawing it. Yeah, and the fact that you do withdraw it is actually a good way to get the attention of those who will um, not go deep enough to have noticed that. Yeah. Uh, so, so, so it's, it's good that it's actually out there and it's good, it, it, it speaks volumes that you actually say, we want to think a little bit on that, at least for now. So let's put it aside uh, and revisit, right? So, so I, I think this way it, it becomes more obvious that there will be um, careful considerations to be made for other features. Okay, so I hereby, uh, uh, all of the champions on both eventual send and tell dot are on this call. It's uh, Michael and Chip and myself. 
Uh, I hereby propose that we remove um, uh, 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 has uh, uh, assignment and delete uh, from eventual support in both proposals. Um, I'm tentatively in favor of that. Um, I think the argument for set is pretty much a slam dunk. I think the argument for has is basically, well, we don't have dot associated with has anywhere else, so might as well get rid of it here. Delete, I think, is probably, it's probably not a problem to leave it in, and it's probably not a problem to take it out. Um, I think taking it out is, results in something which is simpler, which is better. Um, um, I, and, and if we've given up uh, the idea of being sort of uh, sort of relentlessly rigorously orthogonal, then um, then each one of these uh, uh, operations kind of has to stand or fall on its own merits. And I don't see any particular merits to uh, eventual delete. Okay, um, I, I so, think so, I think it's a, another way of putting this is that. What we have when we have a presence that we're sending messages to is something immutable, kind of. <laughs> like it can it can still change its state, but in in the way that uh, Java style, right? Like <laughs> set set property, right? And then you know it's a, set, <laughs> like a literal method that you call, right? So right. yeah. <laughs> Yeah, um, it's not that you're changing its state. It's that you're at, you can only ask it to change its own state. Yeah, and and you're not changing the shape of the object, which is something that's currently enforced by the Marshall layers and stuff. That we have to have our end object. Right. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I, I I'm I, uh, unless I'm going to take this as agreement to remove all that. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Sounds good. Yeah. Good, good. And Sala, thank you for um, pointing out the chained assignment anomaly because I had never noticed it before. Uh, thank you, I, I really appreciate that. And yeah, sorry, you know, like it's uh, a little bit late, uh, you know, thanks. Uh, it's a lot earlier than it than than if you if we had waited for me to notice it. So thank you. <laughs> well, in particular, it's a lot earlier than if it had found its way into implementation. Yeah, that's right. Thank you. Um, shall I go back to this QT library? I yes, yes, yes. Please. Yeah. Okay. So uh, it's it's it was foreign enough that it took me a good long couple of hours to figure out what they were actually trying to do. Okay, do, you want, uh, do you want to project but, again? Oh, yes, I am. Okay, there we go. Okay, good. Um, so they're, they're talking about you want to chain things together. So rather than chaining by the callbacks and then using the results of the callbacks and then throwing stuff and doing all that, you, you define objects that are the operations that you want to do. So uh, each of these objects can be instantiated with some arguments. And then some of those arguments can be async objects and some of them can be just plain regular objects or regular values. And when you have this chain built up, then you call dot call and it, it, uh, tr it uh, propagates errors just as promises do basically. So there's something down here that was a bit, oh, This looks very much like deferred. Like, you know, when you create a new promise and you capture the resolve and reject, and then at some point you actually call those. Um, yeah, the, what, what was, what I found interesting is that, you know, they don't really show you the tree here, but, uh, Maybe it's fair to pull up this. Yeah, I'm not. I'm not getting it yet. Uh, I want to want to find this thing. Okay, so this is an example that they have. Larger font, uh, please. 
or maximize yeah, the. Okay. So uh, they have different ways of composing. I, I just want to find the, the canonical example that they have here. Okay. Um, so this written file object represents writing this path, the first argument, with the contents of the second path. So it's a, it's a wrapper around fs.writeFile. And it accepts as arguments either other async objects or just plain, plain values. And what is an async object? It's something that implements this interface that they described a bit earlier. Okay, so I, mi uh, I missed the interface. Okay, so. So th this is the the best description of well, how the tree translates into actual objects. Okay. Right. So. Um, and each of these objects is either a regular object or an async object. Yeah. So the regular okay. objects are the leads. Okay. And the async objects are the the inner nodes. Okay. Uh, and what is so, the, what is and is there an API that that defines what it means to be an async object? Yes, uh, that's what I got here. Async object looks like this. Um, so it has three types of methods: methods that must be implemented, methods that can be used in declarative composition, and methods that are, cannot be overridden. So uh, an async object has what happens if you call it asynchronously or what happens if you call it synchronously, uh, then on error and on result, which is the promise analogs there. Um, they don't summarize it nearly as well in one place. That is probably why it took a long time to understand this. Okay. This seems like a lot of ceremony around yes. things that you can express fairly straightforwardly with objects and promises. Is there a big payoff that um, justifies this degree of ceremony? So the, the payoff that they're aiming for is that if you have an operation like fs write file, dot write file, Okay. Then you can wrap it in a missing object, and then its arguments can be promises, or they can be other async objects or just regular functions. So from then on, you don't use fs.write file at all. You only use the async object version. And it's this punning on arguments could be promises or other objects, or sorry, could be async objects or, or synchronous values. And does, That's, does, does the mechanism, is, does the framework test that by like instance of async object or something? I, I think that's what they do, but yeah. Okay. Uh, and essentially by doing the punning, it's the same way that await does punning, right? So you can, you can say this is a promise or this is an object and I just get back something that is the object eventually. Mm -hmm. uh, what I've noticed is that most of our downfalls with the weight have been in terms of function arguments, trying to get that into the appropriate representation for a given layer. And this kind of avoids that whole problem. That's, I think, the main thing that they're aiming for. Okay. Yeah, yeah one of the... At first, at first glance, it, it seems like what this offers that you wouldn't have if you were just using plain objects and promises that you construct yourself is is the the deferred initialization that it like it, it's like it's giving you a continuation and it just sits there inert until until you actually fire it off so you can construct yeah. this thing that will happen right but nothing actually does until you until that outermost one does its call yes and, and when it does its call, it, you, it does it in the most optimal way. It just evaluates everything that is not a dependency. 
So uh, this, this could be sugaring to um, uh, like a symbol uh, dot um, something on a function, an async function that would actually allow you to manipulate the return promise object, um, you know, which, which, you know, you get when you start the function call, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and, you know, so, so, so I think, I think the current async await, where every time you call an async method, you're starting a new promise. Um, forces you, you, you know, when you, when you try to optimize, you oftentimes just write it as a sync method and you construct your own promise or return the queued one uh, from the um, identical call, assuming it's, a, it's a, like a trigger, not a, not a parametric um, computation. And the thing here is that it forces all your functions to essentially be functional that there is no such thing as an operation with internal state that's sometimes enabled and sometimes waiting for something else. All the internal state is, is lifted to the arguments. So the arguments would, the, the arguments would only ever be non-async objects. I'm sorry, the parameters would only ever be non-async objects because any async object that appears as an argument would get Resolved before the uh, you know the 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 other function is called. Yes. Okay. There is a pattern for for using coroutines, I believe. Um, and if you have an async caller for the generator, and every time it gets a promise, it awaits the promise before it kicks the next cycle of that generator. Um, I mean, there are patterns that, you know, are trying to use language features to deliver the same uh, kind of like all your functions are synchronous because they only get called when the promise they need is resolved. Mm -hmm. So because this depends on the resolution of all of the argument promises before something is called, um, the, you would never do a stateful update this way because the order in which these things are called is not something you would want to predict. You would not want to depend on the order in which these things are called if they're held back by, by any element of their tree being uh, uh, in their tree of arguments being not yet resolved. Mm -hmm. you, you'd want those, you'd want those operations to be self-contained, depending only on their arguments and not really causing side effects. Okay. And yeah, that, that was, well, that was part of the, um, uh, in the, uh, the original, the, the mid maker code. Uh, the um, uh, you know the early mint maker code uh, that was just natural numbers and and just purses, no payments, and no assays or anything. Just the sort of original expository mint makers. Um, uh, in one of the there there's the issue about the deposit methods and the argument purse. And in one of the publications. Uh, showing the pattern, uh, the one in um, distributed electronic rights in JavaScript, I have the deposit method internally do a dot then on the, on the argument purse uh, so that you can pass in a promise for the argument purse and the deposit doesn't proceed until the promise resolves. Right. And uh, that, that made uh, and it was interesting, the effect that has on the clients is that uh, it has both a pro or a con on the, pro on the clients, which is uh, the client no longer needed to resolve uh, argument promises directly before passing them in to deposit because deposit would, would do its own pausing waiting for them to resolve. Uh, but it was ex exactly at the price of 
uh, not being able to count on the deposit happening before the next message that you sent in. Hmm. And, uh, uh, and we, the, uh, what we found as uh, over time is that, uh, I mean, that, that one's explicitly and necessarily a stateful update. Uh, it's sort of inherent in the semantics that it's a stateful update. So I suppose it's not surprising there that the loss of guaranteed order was the bigger deal rather than waiting for arguments to resolve. Yeah, I, I think what this thing is doing is it's allowing you to express causal dependency using the syntax that you would otherwise ordinarily use for um, for for uh, capturing the the uh, uh, order of operations, um, and so I think there is a uh, there is a there is sort of a gain in um, expressiveness that is that is had at the cost of um, um, a, a a loss in the uh, uh, the clarity of the semantics of what a call means. Yeah. Because you're 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 reifying all these things, and then uh, you're dealing just with a tree of objects instead of a tree of calls, which has its own problems. There, yeah. uh, it 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 takes us further away from the whole promise dot then <clears throat> world, where you know that you're dealing with the promise, so you do something about it, versus. I just want to do this operation. I don't care how it happens. It has to happen in order. Right. But what, what both promise dot then and await do is they, uh, they enable you to be explicit about the points at which you are taking a, um, an interleave opportunity um, in order to uh, insist on the value being available. Mm -hmm. Which so is, Funky, but it is explicit. The fact that you can't write a gen some kind of generic abstraction that's um, para that that can take a uh, async object itself as an argument is interesting. Um, You know, our um, remotely invoked methods, uh, if you pass them a promise as an argument, then they receive a, a promise as an right. argument. Uh, and they can do, they can decide to, like, like the deposit I just described, they could decide to postpone the rest of their internal logic waiting for it. But sometimes you actually want to receive the promise to do something with it, to store it in the data structure or whatever, uh, rather than um, wait for the promise to resolve first. Uh, to, me, to me, this was uh, a motivator for promise.all and Mm -hmm. What you were saying with all comparable before, yeah, how it could take any any arbitrary structure. Then you can then you can wire up the then to just make the best use of the structure that you that you put into it, mm -hmm. rather than yeah. with promise dot all having to pick them out linearly and then reassemble them. Um, yeah, I, I think I'm I think I'm going to show uh, all comparable. Yes, definitely. Because uh, I think I think it's a interesting example of how um, let's see. So, uh, just about the chain part uh, it reminds me um, many times when I'm dealing with promises of a single one time not not you know um, if, if some eventual send I, I wondered if there could be a way to um, you know, introducing the language away for a promise 
or you know a promise um, uh, like someone uh, controlling the fate of a promise to know whether or not another promise is part of the chain for the, the you know so, so if a promise is in the chain of another promise then you would await the one you know that is bigger um, so so this is to avoid deadlocks okay guys I'm going to have to quit zoom and restart in order to project because of the way my system set up so see you soon okay uh yeah Salah. so that that um uh, sorry. It, it's something that we call shortening right because you want to say if this fr promise forwards to another promise then shorten the path between us and them and send the messages on to the new promise yeah, like only await the outer promise, don't await the inner promise, especially if you're the outer promise, right? So, so uh, like, sorry, especially if you're the inner promise, uh, you don't want to await the outer one. Yeah, and, and where this applies in the eventual send proposal is that we're going to need that eventually. Haha. <laughs> because yeah. that's, that's, that's how we can do promise pipelining in the event that promises are forwarded to something else. Yeah, well, serial numbering either on received or on sent, and somehow you would uh, manage that remotes don't mess up the sequence on you, right? Yeah. So. <laughs> okay, so Mark's sharing. Uh, Mark, you're muted. Okay, can you hear me now? Yep. Okay, uh, so you, you didn't hear any of that? Nope. Okay, I'll start again. Um, uh, so our Marshall layer and CAPTP layer uh, uh, in only pass objects that uh, fall within a certain pattern um, uh, where the important part of the, the important thing about the pattern is yeah. it distinguishes uh, three, four, well, let's say it distinguishes the following values. Um, uh, primitives uh, other than unregistered symbols, but let's not worry about that now. Primitives are just passed directly. Um, uh, objects that, frozen objects that follow a pattern that's recognized as uh, this object should be passed by copy, uh, are passed by copy. Um, uh, objects that follow a different pattern uh, that is recognized by um, uh, this layer is indicating this is passed by presence, are passed by presence, are passed by presence. And by what it means but to pass by presence is that um, uh, the object's behavior is accessed by invoking it, uh, and that remote sites should uh, should send should do an eventual send to remotely invoke a method, uh, because no data is going to be copied as the in passing the object around. You're just passing around a remote capability to convey messages back to the original, um, uh, and then there's promises. Uh, which are uh, things that should eventually resolve to one of these other cases. Um, uh, and, the, uh, and then finally, anything that's not recognized as falling into one of these cases uh, is just rejected with an error. So the interesting thing about uh, pass by copy objects is as they get copied around, each cop there's no tracking of identity. There's no attempt to 
make them one for one identity wise the way uh, let's say membranes do. So this is very different uh, than, than a membrane like semantics. You're not trying to preserve transparency of JavaScript. You're defining sort of this higher level remote object semantics. Uh, so if you pass the same pass by copy object twice, it might arrive as two different copies that are otherwise identical, but have different object identity. So pass by copy objects, are, you're not supposed to pay attention to their identity. Um, uh, pass by presence objects, uh, the, uh, there's a remote thing called a presence uh, that is uh, supposed to have, supposed to be the one for one identity um, uh, as the pass by presence object uh, that it designates. So those things have reliable, unforgeable identity that are one for one. Um, and then uh, promises are, uh, when they appear in the structure, uh, are also things where, where you're not supposed to pay attention to their identity if the same promise is passed to a counterparty multiple times uh, it might arrive as different promises that are behaviorally uh, essentially identical, that mean the same thing, except that, that at the JavaScript level, they have different identities. So at the level of semantics, of the semantics of the distributed object system, we're defining, it's as if the cases that, that I said don't pay attention to their identity, it's as if those are things without identity. Uh, and that, therefore, if you wanted to compare uh, two passable things for equality, what you sh the equality test should recur down through all of the pass by copy structures, comparing them structurally until it gets to something other than pass by copy structures. Uh, which it would then compare by identity. Um, uh, however, promises, if encountered, fall into neither of those categories. You don't yet know what they're a promise for, so you can't recur into them to do a structural compare. And, you, and likewise, if they're a promise for something with identity, you don't know what that identity is, and you should not use the promise identity. So, uh, we define um, uh, this operation that I'm pleased to say, all of which fits on the screen, um, uh, called all comparable, which is kind of a pun on promise.all. Uh, promise.all is shallow for one level of array, and this is deep through all pass by copy structures, but had performed sort of the same treatment of promises on the fringe, but, but does that treatment also deeply? So if you give it a passable object, i.e. something that uh, obeys all of the rules of passability that I enumerated and such that all of the promises in the structure, when they fulfill, will fulfill to things that are themselves passable recursively, uh, if you, so if you give it such a passable thing, then it gives you back a promise for a comparable. A comparable is a passable in which the, the leaves of the pass by copy tree are only things with, um, uh, that are primitive values or have reliable identity, i.e. pass by presence things. Uh, so, uh, so first of all, uh, did all of that make sense? I, that was sounded like a big run on sentence. Uh, I, I have I an so. application. Uh, okay. Go ahead. Yeah, I, I'm just cooking together an example that uses this stuff in something that I think would be useful. Um, and, and this may be a way of abstracting away what the async promise stuff 
is trying to do. Yeah. And, and what we found was that by using all comparable, we were often able to take um, a complex structure of either nested thens or, nest, or chained weights. Basically, we're able to take all sorts of um, nested weighted, manual weighting structures based on a particular structure. Uh, and by just turning a passable into a comparable, uh, you're just doing all of those weights within the all comparable abstraction in just the way the promise dot all it, you're doing your 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 takes care of a, a bunch of weights or a bunch of thens for you, so you can then just do one then on the outside rather than all the do, all the dot thens on the inside. The the thing that's this is highlighting something that that I suspect I was just not understanding all along um where basically what you're getting what you're guaranteed to get back from this is in this case the operation you want to do is a comparison but actually what it is it's, is it's something you can do something with um uh, right. it's, it's it's once once we have the idea of a comparable we actually end up using this even when we don't want to compare Right. Simply well, I mean, because we want to delay until we've resolved all of the internal promises in the pass by copy tree. Right. Well, I mean, this is this is kind of figures into my standard explanation of why promise pipelining is powerful. Is basically it allows you to to not look at the value until you actually need to look at the value. You, you actually need the bit right. Or whatever. But in this case, the one thing which feels weird to me uh, is presence. And that is because um, I'm unclear whether that denotes the, the thing that you got um, that is um, the, the local presence of a remote uh, a remote object, or could that, in any, which you can, which you can now do eventual sends on, um, but that's also a, a remote promise is something that you can do eventual sends on, which is um, um, right. You can do eventual sends on a remote promise, but uh, you don't. The remote promise can be unresolved. Right. Uh, so, so you don't, it's not yet in canonical form. So right. it might go through intermediaries um, uh, and uh, it not, does not yet have identity. Right. The right. presence is an, is a re remote non-promise object that has identity. Uh, and in particular, when you do on a remote promise, you do, a, this, this is actually the way in which we derive the need for an explicit presence object. Right. Is if you have a remote if you have a remote promise and you do a dot then on it, uh, you uh, if the remote promise once the remote promise is fulfilled to a remote object, uh, so this you is want to I eventually remember. call the the success callback of the dot then, but so you can't call it with the, the with the object that the promise is fulfilled with, because that object itself is remote. Right. So this is what a remote promise resolves to when it resolves to something. Uh, right. And both a presence and a, a remote promise are things that you can do eventual sends on. Um, right. But only one of them is a thing which has identity. Right. Right. Exactly. Okay. Right. And, um, and this because it has identity, you can compare it. Right. Right. And because it's fully resolved, uh, under our semantics, you're also guaranteed that it's um, a direct path. Right. That when you when you send it when you send it a message, even if it's, a, it's an eventual send, you know that there is some some somebody is at home for the message to be received by. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, that's clarifying. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, one thing that's weird about the classification here, 
past style of on line 52 is named that in order to suggest an analogy to type of. Um, uh, it's um, giving you the classification according to the remote object semantics that our Marshall and CAPTP define. And a uh, past style of does not distinguish a past by presence object from a presence. Um, and I think preparing for the future, that's a good idea, but it's certainly surprising. So that would mean that if, if it's a local past by presence object, you still interact with it with eventual sense? Uh, you, you certainly can interact with it with eventual sense. Um, uh, if it's local, you can, you can also interact with it with dot. Right. Uh, the reason we call the remote objects presences uh, is uh, because we anticipate growing the um, uh, the CAPTP layer um, uh, in order to host something more like the UNUM presences, uh, which also relates to something that uh, uh, Dan Finley said, I think right before we turned recording on. Um, uh, so let me, so Chip originated the UNUM model. Um, uh, uh, so I'll, I'll, uh, well, I'll say a bit about how I, I see it fitting into here, but then I'll, I'll let Chip explain the UNUM model. Um, uh, so, so the idea is that if the past by presence object uh, understands that a remote representative of it is going to be constructed, it might want that remote representative to be something that, that at that remote site is more expressive than just an empty object and can satisfy some queries locally. So if there's um, you know, some, something that's, uh, for example, a stable, a stable piece of state, um, that it might duplicate the state on the remote presence and then provide a method on the remote presence that depends only on the remote state so that somebody with that presence could actually do dot on it uh, to say, um, I know that for this abstraction, all the presences have this tiny API, the API that, that can be supported locally at all locations. So I'll just invoke it with dot. Um, uh, so in E, we call this pass by construction, uh, which is to say that um, as opposed to pass by, pass by copy, is that the, pa the original pass by presence object uh, explains to the comm system how to construct a remote representative of itself on the other side. Uh, so I don't have any concrete plans to do that, but I anticipate we will eventually do that. Um, sorry, a quick question here, because uh, I think this, um, this relates very much to the idea that I, I, I was trying to reappropriate the uh, under, um, under um, um, bar under bar proto and JSON, um, uh, I guess, parsing. And I was thinking you would want to import the module that exports the class of that particular object uh, rather than to actually pass the prototype itself and somehow re, uh, you know, ensure that it actually nests as a prototype. And this way you would actually not be duplicating all the prototypes. Yeah, you've 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 identified exactly um, the 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 area that makes pass by construction hard, which is um, uh, the remote object can only have behavior if there is remote code to give it behavior, uh, and the remote code would have to be selected by the pass by presence object explaining how to construct it. Uh, and that means there has to be some kind of shared namespace or something such that one side can explain what code to use on the other side. Well, you need, uh, you need to either, either have 
some way of making reference to something which you know to exist on the other side, and presumably this is by pre-agreement on what that set of things would be, um, or you need some way to um, convey along with the description of a thing um, to convey that code itself as part of what you you deliver as the bundle of stuff, which now gets into you know all the sort of remote module loading and and yeah. uh, code transport and all of that can of worms. Yes. Uh, so so th this is um, so right now at outside of the comm system, the um, uh, Agoric smart contracting support. Uh, has a essentially a special purpose hand encoding of this kind of remote code binding uh, in one special case, which is um, uh, what we call extent ops. And the key thing about extent ops is that um, uh, there's very, very few pieces of code that uh, that that um, currently exists that provide sort of a menu of behaviors to select from. Uh, and uh, so, so right now, uh, we felt free in just making that a namespace that we can, that we control and coordinate. Um, uh, and obviously anything that moves Pass by construction into the comm system uh, has to make has to wrestle with with you know what is generally meaningful under mutual suspicion and uh, agreement on shared namespaces uh, at a low level is probably not something we can um, put in at that layer so. So there's definitely there's definitely sort of a and then a miracle happens on um, uh, my desires to to revive the Unum model. Yeah, there's lots of really interesting unsolved problems there, which we've kind of got a, a fingernails grasp on, um, um, you know, a hint at um, the tantalizing possibility of there might be a solution to this problem, um, but absent um, a both a compelling use case and an immediate um, but you know an immediate need and uh, resources to divert to investigating this it kind of remains this sort of tantalizing possibility off in the distance right and the the wonderful thing about agoric uh, strategy uh, with regard to these issues as as a business and as somebody you know as a, as a company trying to deliver a smart contracting platform uh, is that we found that we could practically do everything we actually needed to do uh, without solving this problem so we're going to leave this problem postponed probably for a good long time right well in fact and in fact the way we solved this problem in in habitat um, back at the dawn of you know history uh, which is where the Unum model came from in the first place, was that every client had distributed to it a disk that contained the definitions of all of the resources that were available to assemble stuff from. Um, and, um, and as a special case solution to um, almost any specific uh, business problem, um, that may be um, sufficient. Yeah, provided that the disk itself is not a vulnerability to to fall in the wrong hand, right? So, well, yeah, but I mean, it, in in the modern age, that's just a um, and, you know, yeah. a, a resource bundle with a well known um, yeah. uh, public hash. Yeah, it, it corresponds exactly to what we're doing in our our special case, which is we just become the stewards of the namespace and the coordination of the namespace. So that one side so one side can say a name of in that namespace that uh, designates a piece of code, 
and uh, and then if it's a if it's a name exactly in that namespace, then the other side will take it to be that piece of code and um, and create and 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 use it to make uh, the corresponding objects on the other side. Yeah, exactly. But but it's not something that the comm system recognizes. Uh, it's something outside the comm system. And as I'm saying this, I'm thinking, well, maybe that is the solution. Is that because the way you solve uh, the um, you know the, the trust problems that would be created by trying to have global coordination in a namespace is just don't have global coordination in a namespace, and then the abstractions that turn this low-level distributed object semantics into an unum semantics can be uh, abstractions that are built on top of this layer, uh, where, where multiple different ones can be built on top of the same comm system. So they don't have to coordinate on a namespace with each other. Yeah, yeah, no, I, I, I agree with that. I don't think, I don't think the uh, solution is this problem is baked into the comm system. I think it is, it is built using the comm system. Okay. I think that's right. Uh, Michael, with regard to the uh, async tree abstraction, um, yeah. the, to what degree would, how much of the benefit of that would we get in a piece of code that just did an all comparable on its arguments taken as a whole? Yes. Um, uh, so that it, so it lost its ordering, but would only get the comparable arguments, not the passable arguments. Yeah. So uh, that's I, I'm I'm working on something that I'm calling p apply for now. Uh, that would take that to its logical conclusion, which is this is the exact opposite of eventual send. Uh, Eventual send, you don't know the destination, but you do know the arguments. Uh -huh. And p apply, you do know the destination, it's a function, but you don't know the arguments. They're promises of, of mixed kinds. Okay. So with the p apply, that would return a promise that you could then, uh, and basically you can construct these method calls. Uh, they're, they're calling just a single function, but, uh, the construction that I have in mind, I'll just show you here quickly. We're almost out of time. But, um, so what I'm thinking is on the lines of, there would be these special kinds of arguments to, or things that you could embed in the arguments. And it's just a, an apply of this function with these arguments. And something like p apply callback would say, this means I should do a new promise. And then when the FS write file calls that callback, it should resolve the promise. Uh, on the other hand, we could do something, this could be separated out so it's more orthogonal, but the uh, a p apply of console.log with whatever arguments we got sent into this function. So it's just, uh, the important thing is that we'd be able to do something like args this. Uh, so uh, I'm confused. The how the p apply args is just uh, is defined on line four. Mm -hmm. so, it's, so its identity would would be like a magic token that basically substitutes the arguments to, to that were supplied to the then clause. Uh, that violates uh, capability design principles. 
you can think of this second argument to a p apply as a template for what the function should do that p apply returns. So p apply in this case would just return something like args console.log args is same value one, two, three. Okay, so so okay, so what is the overall semantics of lines six and seven taken together? So six and seven, this uh, the callback thing. Okay, so I essentially want two different functions for now, um, but basically we're doing a make promise, and this is. Uh, And this is a make callback. Where we're saying we want to promise that's made from calling the FS write file with these arguments. That appears a promise. And, and so, are you calling FS write file with the data P promise, or are you calling it, are you expressing that you want to call it with what that promise fulfills to. I'm expressing I want the fulfillment. Okay. Okay. And then this p apply callback is essentially uh, so this first one would go something like new promise project. I gotta go. I have a hard stop. Okay. I, yeah. See you. Okay. See ya. Bye bye. Uh, I also do, but that was a lot of fun. Thanks for introducing me to the Unum uh, library. Oh, I'm gonna yeah, be reading about that. Yeah, I yeah, think we'll ad ad adjourn once this example is complete. So. Cool. That's the concise or the expanded way of writing this this line where we're making a promise that resolves a certain way. Ah, uh, ah, uh, ah, uh. and the FS write file, we're assuming that that has the node signature of a node yeah. callback. Okay. Uh, yeah, that's what the, that's what the CB is supposed to be for. So, other ways of doing this, we could pass in arguments that correspond to the resolve or the reject. Oh, I see. The call by callback, you meant the node callback style. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, this one here goes like that. So we don't gain a lot from the second one. Uh, what I was thinking is that um, rather than reconstructing, uh, I guess what I mean to say is that the the template here pays off because we have a, a, a rather deep kind of nesting in our arguments. Uh, 
and if the promise was more deeply nested in the arguments, then the, the same algorithm is all comparable would be able to find it. And just do the same as the promise at all, which places it back in the same structure. So right. I'm, I'm, I'm getting a little bit confused because of the noise of adapting to the node callback style. Okay. Let's say that FS write FS write file was written, was itself written in the way we would write it as something that return that was already written to return a promise. Then it would be fs.promises. Okay. I had the order of these arguments wrong. Oh, is that the node convention for things that return promises? Yeah. I see. Uh, for, for FS specifically. Oh, okay. This would be new promise. Oh no, this would just be. See, this is where I was thinking if we have one function that does templates of other functions, then uh, it could decide what to do based on the magic arguments that it was given, whether the, the callback was specified or so on. What do you mean by templates? Uh, like the whole point of this this p make promise or p apply would be to say uh, fs.promises.write file um, so essentially all comparable and args that's kind of why I'm driving up so the dot so the dot the, oh I see I see I see dot then args and the all comparable on that Okay, well, line nine doesn't look bad. Yeah, and that's kind of the style I was aiming for originally. Um, it does not look bad. Okay. If, if we just did that, that would be fine too. Okay. Um, uh, so, so yeah, there's always a bias, um, you know, towards the code that one oneself has written because one is more familiar with it. Mm -hmm. But so, 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 you know, I'm about to express a. Uh, preference for line 10 over line eight. Um, yeah. Uh, but I want to, you know, take it with a grain of salt because of course I wrote all comparable. And yeah. I, never, I haven't seen make promise before. Um, but I'm really, I mean, I'm all comparable is a something we also have, we have for a variety of reasons. Mm -hmm. And line 10, you don't have to understand anything beyond all, all comparable to see what line 10 means. Right. Yeah. Okay. And, and likewise, the so the reason why I call it p apply is that it's probably more like a, uh, oh, I see. I see. I see. Right. It's because you're taking a, like apply, you're taking a function and a list of arguments and the P says delay. Yeah. Delay for the arguments to be resolved. Okay. Um, that makes sense to me. The analogy with apply makes it make a lot more sense to me. And if we, so with P apply, uh, 
uh, and assuming uh, assuming that we don't have to worry about things like the node call uh, adapters to the node callback style. Mm. Maybe we're not trying to solve that here. If we if we assume away the node callback style, uh, and we had both p apply and all comparable, uh, would we need any of the constants defined on lines one through five? Um, so the reason I wanted that was so that we would be able to, uh, write an abstraction. Like I, I still find myself using new promise in different cases, mostly when I'm doing node programming, but uh, it's come up before. And Sorry, say, say, say that again. Oh, I, I'm promise, using okay. new promise. Yeah. Okay. Okay. And new promise tends to be extremely verbose. Yeah. To write. Yeah. Uh, so, so how would these let you uh, give me an example where you would want to, to um, write new promise. Um, uh, uh, but where these constants could enable you not to write it. So what I would think is that like the async tree pattern, uh, if the functions that we're dealing with are my own, and I say, apply uh, my spawn or something, and say that it takes, um, been true, uh, and then some other arguments. Uh, and then I want to say it also takes a resolve and a reject. Then I can write my spawn as program args is all yeah. um I'm I'm not understanding this. Yeah, so <laughs> I'm trying to say, no, I lost my train of thought. Oh, well, <laughs> might come back. Okay. Um, maybe new promise is the only way to do certain things is the best way. Yeah. Um, so I, I like this kind of exploration. We should do more of it, but um, uh, in order to avoid um, how much context people need to catch up on and, and such, uh, I think I'm going to go ahead and declare this, this meeting adjourned. Mm -hmm. And this was great. This was, we really, this was a very good exploration. Okay, uh, thanks everyone. Uh, thanks for that. I have a question for you. Could I talk to you after this? Yes. Uh, 